good to see all of you out here this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. And what will we do on that day? Rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing together, O Worship the King. O worship the King, all glorious above. O gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. The earth with its store of wonders unfold. Almighty thy power hath founded of old, and that lived in past by a changeless decree, and round it hath passed like a mantle the sea. A bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the night. From the hills it descends to the plain and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of God and feeble as frail, indeed do we trust, nor find we to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end are made. thank you that you are our redeemer that you are our friend lord we thank you that you are god and not another indeed father your word says that all the gods of the nations are mere idols they are absolutely nothing father we praise you for who you are and for the salvation that you've given us through jesus christ lord this morning now as we begin this time of worship and praise and bible study we pray lord that you would be in our midst Father, that you would open our hearts and our minds, not just to what your word says, Father, but to the ministry of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might understand that we are in your presence more than you being in our presence. Father, we thank you for what you're going to accomplish here this morning, and we thank you, Lord, for each one who's here this morning as well. For it's in your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. Let's continue singing this morning. You are my vision. And... Um, if you know the hymn, Thou Art My Vision, I think is how that one goes. This is basically, this is going from King James to NIV, if you want to put it that way. The language is 20th century instead of 16th. Anyway, let's go ahead and sing. You are my vision. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else has.
doesn't mean, though, that you, ha- you can just kind of, you know, lay low on the singing. We're still going to keep singing, okay? But we're going to give you a rest here. Let's continue. Above all else. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above Above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified. Behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Romans 4, 1 through 8. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted by righteousness, as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And this morning, Father, I just pray for all of those who are unable to be with us for one reason or another, sickness, traveling, whatever the circumstances. I just ask, Father, that you specifically be with those who are suffering from illness of any kind. Just let them know that you are with them, you love them, and that you will always be with them. Father, we miss them, and we look forward to the time they can turn to us and praise you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing this morning as we continue singing. This one is Give Me Jesus. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Father, most of the time we're not all that lovely, and yet you just continue loving us all the same, and we praise you for that. Lord, this morning as as pastor comes to bring the message that you've laid upon his heart, 
Father, I pray that you would speak through him. Lord, use him simply as your mouthpiece to proclaim to us what you want us to hear. And Father, I pray that you would take that message and that you would accomplish in each person here this morning what you want to accomplish through it. Father, I pray that you would embolden Pastor, that you would encourage him, that you would strengthen him, and Lord, that he would be filled with your spirit as he proclaims that message this morning. And we'll be sure and give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Would you focus your attention to verses 6 through verses 8? As you've noticed, we are not rushing through this chapter and or through this series. Paul goes on as a lawyer with a lawyer approach to unpack even deeper what it means to receive the grace and the forgiveness what it means to have this relationship with God in light of the accusing law and God's grace and loving care and the way that he deals with that law in order to bring righteousness into our lives. Verse 6, just as David who also speaks of the blessing, circle the world blessing, that word will lead us through the rest of these um, phrases As the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. That's the other word, counting. The Lord uses this. He doesn't overlook, nor does God take this with a light um, approach. He takes care in fulfilling the law in a miraculous way and also opening up his heart, pouring out grace. Scripture says that the law came through Moses, and we learn that that law actually was given, not that we would be able to fulfill it, though some people try to say that I've done that. That law teaches us that you cannot keep the law as much as you'll try. But through Christ Jesus, says John, came grace and truth. And we want to be on that receiving end of grace. And it's so hard for us, however, to live in giving others that grace. Because of our sinful nature, we demand righteousness in accordance to those that have wronged us, but we ask for grace when we have made the mistake and the sin. Uh, Paul comes here to show us what God does. And in doing so, we remember what Peter says. He says, be holy for I am holy. We're called to be imitators of God. Paul says, be imitator of Christ as I am following him. So as we look at this and see how the Lord treats that sin, and the Lord gives us that forgiveness, we've got to ask the question, how can I live this to those around me? We live in a world right now that's full of hatred, and we have reasons, and you may find reasons on both sides, and obviously the side opposing yours is unjustified reasoning, and your side is fully justified to be angry at people that are doing wrong. The world knows very little about forgiveness. It knows a lot about hatred, revenge, and it may seem that it feels good to get that vengeance. That's why God says, vengeance is mine, because him and his perfection, his justice is righteous, ours is not. As we walked at the beginning of the chapter, and we saw that it's love and faith. We saw that Abraham is being called a friend of God. And in the joy that the Lord says, you know what, you used to be servants, now I call you friends. But he leaves them by saying, you're my brothers and sisters, and we have one father. A relationship that is so close. Religion is not what God is looking in man's heart. He's looking for that relationship. And that's where maybe a lot of the churches today, and maybe even in our own lives, 
we hit and miss in this relationship because we think we fulfilled what God wanted. And like the rich young man, we say, what, what am I lacking? How come I don't feel? Not that we come to Christ by feelings, right? We come by faith. And yet there's no peace in our hearts because we've been very religious but not loving. It's love and faith. Last week, we traversed the idea that the Lord, when He's looking at us in this faith, He wants us to understand that it's this grace that He gives us. It's the grace and faith. So when somebody says, just have faith, He actually wants to remind us what Scripture teaches about that. It's about God's grace, not my righteousness. It is His forgiveness. And now, Paul, the ever-so-present lawyer, he actually makes these arguments according to the law in Deuteronomy and bring in two witnesses to uphold his point about God's grace and the law. And this morning we'll look at forgiveness and faith. We want to receive it, but now we have to live it because it takes faith to receive God's forgiveness even though you may think that you don't deserve it, you're the last person on earth for what you've done to be forgiven. God wants to forgive. And then on the giving end, it takes faith to forgive others, right? Because our reaction would be is, well, what if I forgive him and he does it again? Well, you forgive him not on his account as God has forgiven you, not on your account, but on Christ's account. So when you forgive, you forgive because of Jesus. Not because of your enemies or your families or friends promise that they won't do it again. You forgive because of what Jesus means to you. And all this, all it does, it brings you on a tighter, closer, more passionate relationship with Jesus. As David speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness about, uh, apart from works. Blessed, there's that word again, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's another word you want to underline because it means a lot both to David because he knew all about trying to cover his sin and then God coming around and covering his sin of what he had done. We'll unpack that a bit later. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin see how often this word counting is in there meaning that god he knows he keeps account however somehow apparently you're showing us how he writes that off doesn't just forget it we'll talk about that in a bit as well where he talks about that he cast your sins as far as the east is from the west he wants to forget them god cannot forget what happens when his work of grace and forgiveness is poured into your life. Well, what this should do to us as we understand deeper, the work that he does in our life should excite us with the way we should live. Excite us in our testimony. Blessed is the man. It's the same word that Jesus uses, right, in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed is he, right, who is poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. This word, makarios, is a word that the Greeks used only towards gods. A very high supreme blessing, supernatural, that changes your whole outlook on life. Well, today's believers uh, may, may not feel blessed uh, by the things they receive, the healings they get, uh, all these earthly things. We've taken our eyes off from what God means this blessing to be, to the things that are so earthly. But Paul comes around and he wants to really unpack that. That this blessing has to do with a relationship with God. Um, I don't know, if I was 16 years old, the first time I got a ticket. And I had to go downtown Chicago. I don't know what it was for. A stop sign, uh, speeding, I don't remember. And I was in this, you were not with me at 16. And I went downtown, and this room filled with people. And, uh, you, know, you know, if you've ever been, you know that the prosecutor comes to you beforehand, and he's trying to make deals with you, right, to save the state money and save you some worries and 
you know, stress. Um, didn't come to me at that time, and uh, we all sat, I don't know, a room of 100 people, and we're waiting, and you know, you'd rather be in a dentist chair than be in a courtroom, right? And uh, we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, the judge comes out, he says, all of you can go home. All of your citations have been forgiven. <sighs> Do you know that feeling of not being guilt or at least not having to pay, to pay the punishment for your guilt? The joy you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go to dinner. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to invite my friends over. Let's all be happy. Not guilty. We, we understand that a little bit. Sometimes we feel that pressure when people hold a judgment over us. You've wronged somebody, you feel guilty, and you want to tell them, I'm sorry. And the worst thing they can do is, I'm not talking to you ever again. Have you ever done that? Have you maybe not said it, but in your mind you thought it? I'm not dealing with Joe, I'm not dealing with Mary ever again. Look what they've done. There's a problem with that. And we'll open up a little bit later where Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, Our Father which art in heaven, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And he ends the whole prayer with, For if you do not forgive men your sins, the Father in heaven will not forgive you. Obviously we're talking about a lifestyle of unforgiveness, right? So here's what... Um, what Paul is doing in these three verses as he wants to present what it means to have God put together forgiveness and the faith. Because only through this faith we receive the righteousness and believing. I remember uh, shortly after I gave my life to Christ and I, 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 by, by faith I took First John chapter 1, 10 and 11 that those who believe he has given them the right to become children of God. And, and maybe one day I felt like I don't feel like a Christian. What do I feel different? I'm like, I don't feel anything. And my mentor told me, it's not what you feel, it's what you believe. So I took that verse, and that's my verse. If God ever asked me as I enter heaven, why should I? I got the verse right there. By faith, I believe, then you gave me the right to become your child. Faith in the forgiveness. Commentator Boyce says this. Paul takes that principle and the legal approach of Deuteronomy asking that you should not take any legal account against anybody unless there's two or three witnesses, right? Stay open with me to Deuteronomy 19.15. This is the mind of Paul. He really wants to be understood, and he is building this case that's foolproof, right? A legal matter must be established by two or more witnesses. Deuteronomy 19.15, what witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed? A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. As a former Pharisee and a, a student of the law, he knew what he was doing. Remember he started talking about Abraham? Abraham was forgiven. He was counted righteousness because of what he believed. He believed that what God told him, remember, not just the fact that he took him to a new place called Canaan, but he believed the gospel, right? That God preached the gospel. He gave Abraham the gospel, believing in a Messiah, believing in a life in paradise, not just on earth. So he uses Abraham as his first witness, and now he brings David. He's got two witnesses. He's making his case. And these verses come from Psalm 32, verses 6 and 7 and 8. Open with me to Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. Here's what David says. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. They're not synonyms. They both mean something. To be forgiven and for your sin to be covered Something placed over it so he would not be seen, so you would not be held accountable. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. This word keeps appearing. The fact that God knows, he numbers, but then he chooses not to hold it against you. And this will teach us something about the way we treat each other when we forgive each other. Because many will say, I will forgive you, but I won't. 
forget, yeah, I won't forget. We, we you know, unless you hit your head, right? Uh, you, you will not forget, especially the one that stabbed you in the back. What do you do with that? Because you've got to forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a choice. It's a, primarily a choice that God makes. He chooses, though aware of your wrongdoing, but he chooses not to hold it over your head. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. Let's look at this phrase real quick just for a second. Counts righteousness. And this actually leads us in this first idea and principle this morning of grace imputed over the law. Grace is imputed, it's placed above over the law. Counts righteousness, this phrase right here. What, it, what does it mean? Both in the original and the dictionary, it means to credit, to set to one's account. Seeing what it is, it is resolved by placing something on that account. It's used many times through Romans, 11 times in chapter 4 to count, place over. First of all, as grace is imputed over, uh, over the law, righteousness is imputed, or as the uh, or New King James Version says, reckoned. We know this word, an ancient word more or less. It is reckoned, placed towards. It's reckoned to the genuine believer by God. Righteousness is placed over. Look at Romans chapter 4. Verse 22, 25, later in the chapter, he comes back to this idea. And here are the words again, three times in these verses, 22 through 25. That is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. It was reckoned, right? It was overlapped, this righteousness. But the words, and then he begins to explain it, it was counted to him, was not written for his sake alone, but for ours only. So we come under this covering, this imputing of righteousness. Remember we talked about last time? When God begins to impute, he does a positive thing and a negative thing. First of all, he doesn't count your sins against you. And the positive thing, he counts Christ's righteousness on your behalf. It was counted, verse 24, to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, Verse 25, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So righteousness, what do you receive? Righteousness. God sees you with the same lens through the blood of Christ as being right, holy. That's why when the apostles write in the epistles, to the saints in, to the saints in, you are saints. Now you've got the strength to live up and grow within that sainthood in a practical way for what God has given you in righteousness. The second thing, Scripture says that a genuine believer is immersed. And here now we get the idea of what happens in baptism. That symbol, it symbolizes what had taken place in your private relationship when you repented and God had forgiven you and has placed that righteousness over you, you are immersed. It is imputed upon you, this uh, righteousness. It's reckoned and counted. You count it as dead in Christ's death. And the old man is reckoned as crucified in Christ's death. That's why Paul says, I am crucified, right, in Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and now he realizes, and yet the life I live, I live by faith in Christ. It is not a once and done activity where I had faith one time, but now daily I live. And daily I recognize I've been forgiven, I am forgiven today, and therefore I daily forgive, in a practical sense, the people around me. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. And seeing 
Like we are immersed, reckoned, imputed this righteousness. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ? And actually, he's going to take this idea in the next verses, verses 9 and on, where we, he talks about circumcision and uh, only the circumcised are saved. How about only the uncircumcised? And here we will see a symbol of the value of baptism. It's not just getting wet and getting dunked. It is a picture of the ultimate work that Christ has done. And through that immersion, we, we are imputed in the death of Christ. And as we are brought back out of the water, it is as being resurrected with Christ, a symbol of what had taken place when you accepted Jesus. Back to verse 3 in Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We were baptized unto his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. It's a marking symbol of a transition of your life from death to life, which will remind you all for the rest of your life that I am Christ, both in my personal surrender and repentance, but also in the witness before the children of God, I've been baptized. I was not saved by baptism. I was saved, therefore I was baptized. And all this is the picture of forgiveness and faith imputed righteous. Thirdly, we see that Scripture clearly says that Romans 6 verse 5, which is the next verse in our chapter 6, that a resurrected life is imputed or reckoned and put to the account of the believer through Christ's resurrection. Only grace is able to satisfy God's requirement and God's law. Without that grace, all of humanity is guilty. And we're born on our way to God's judgment and hell. But grace comes in and intercepts through faith. Look at um, Romans 6, verse 5 and, and verse 8. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, what happens now? Do I just cross my arms and wait for the rapture or live my life in sin? By no means, says Paul many times. Here's what happens. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. How does one know that he is saved? One looks within, and by faith, you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, which has been given you, saying, Daddy, I belong to the Father. And then, that is an inward uh, witness of my salvation, but the outward are the fruits. We have a couple of fishermen in this church and a couple of hunters. Does a hunter no good to have the finest rifles? I told you about me and Lowell going hunting a couple of years ago. And uh, my wife laughs that my rifles are good enough to be on the shelf. They're not scratched. They weren't dropped. They were not filled with blood while I was trying to cut any animals. Yes, I've hunted and I've, I've, I've gotten uh, game back in out east. However, looking at Lowell's rifle, he's got these paper and all these markings of distances and sighting and what it should do and where it should aim. It looks like it's been used. It looks like it's been bloodied. He's got a lot of game. That rifle has experience. And many times, we treat our faith in the same way whether it's good to look good on the shelf, but what proof is there? What kind of hunter are you if there are no heads of antelope or elk uh, in your, I can't have it in my house, so maybe my garage if I ever get one, but he's got some in his house. You walk in, and the first thing you'd say, you won't say, hey, where'd you buy that? You say, when'd you get that? Tell me the story, because there's fruit, right? He is a hunter and a fisherman, uh, he's got fruit, he's got 